Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar. I am IFOPA Family Services Manager, Hope Newport, and you are at Meeting Them on Their Level, an introduction to explaining FOP to children. So I am going to um, real quick just go over a few sort of housekeeping things. We do have professional translation support available tonight in Spanish. So um, I will go ahead and if we have Spanish, any Spanish speaking folks joined yet, um, which no one, no Spanish speaking folks yet. So I'll keep going with this, but the good news is we will have a Spanish, a version of this recording available in Spanish. So a great resource for our community moving forward. Um, and I also wanted to let everyone know that today's webinar um, in all webinar fashion is um, only audio from Alexis and I presenting. So you um, as attendees can say hello in the chat if you'd like to, or if you have a question at the end, feel free to use the raise hand feature in your Zoom toolbar. And I'll be happy to unmute you if you'd like to ask your question verbally. Otherwise, please go ahead um, and feel free to use that Q&A box in your Zoom toolbar at the bottom of your screen. And um, you can put your questions in as Alexis and I are presenting. And if it's something that's very on topic with what we're talking about, we may address it there in the moment, but otherwise we'll hold all of the questions until the end. And um, so with that, I will go ahead and we will get started. So I wanted to start today's webinar by saying a big thank you to all of the FOP community leaders who have devoted their time to supporting children and the FOP community in their journey of understanding. So um, there's several people who've written books or um, illustrated comics to be shared with com younger community members to help them in their understanding. So to Sarah Steele and Marilyn Hare, to Nancy Sando and her late husband, Andy Sando, um, Kathy Ford, who has FOP and her husband, Chuck Ford, who did a Leonard the Lizard, and then Amy Specht, who has a book that will be released, I believe it's um, early next year. And of course, um, this what is FOP questions and answers for the children. It was an incredible guidebook that's created by Sarah and her mother Marilyn and the IFOPA actually has copies of this that we share with families um, free of charge. So if you don't have one of those at home yet and you'd like one to share with your child, please let me know and I'd be happy to send one to you. They are currently only available in English. Um, and last but not least, I just wanted to say a thank you to our 2023 IFOPA Family Services Programming Supporter, BioCrest. So it gives me great pleasure today to introduce um, our presenter and Alexis Gonzalez and I are going to kind of be tag teaming co-presenting today's webinar, but Alexis, like myself, is a certified child life specialist. She is also a certified therapeutic recreation specialist, and Alexis has been a longtime member of the FOP community. I think we were talking the other day and Alexis said... Um, that she reminded me that her brother AJ was diagnosed when he was two and they're about 12 years apart. So for 10 years now, um, Alexis has been a part of this community in some way, shape or form. Um, and in 2008, she um, used the, she helped run and facilitate the FOP fun zone at our Baltimore family gathering. And she also did that for us in Orlando in 2019, and then virtually in 2020. So she's been helping me in my support of the community, our pediatric community for some time. And she is, as I mentioned, a child life specialist and recreational therapist at Wiseman's Children Rehabilitation Hospital. So it's been incredible to hear about the work she's doing there to support families. Um, so with that, Alexis, I am going to go ahead. Oh, and I'll do the overview real quick before I hand it over to you and you can introduce a little bit more about yourself if you'd like um, and take us through our first slide. But today we are going to go through six main categories to help um, all of you feel more prepared and have resources to talk to your children about FOP. Um, we'll start with just some general tips for communicating with children. 
an overview of different coping styles, some things to keep in mind in preparing for the conversation, and then um, eight key points to cover, really specific to FOP. And then we're gonna go through um, some different wording and activities to use with the following age ranges you see there. And lastly, we'll finish by focusing on how you can empower your child to educate others. So with that, Alexis, I will hand it over to you. Thank you, Hope. Hi, everyone. I'm so excited to be here today. Um, as Hope said, my younger brother, AJ, was diagnosed um, at the age of two and a half, and he is now 12, going on 13 this year. Um, so I have a younger sister as well. So uh, our conversations regarding FOP were all over the place all the time. We kind of ironed out all the wrinkles and um, I'm really excited to share some of this information alongside Hope and hopefully uh, give you guys some tips and tricks to communicate with your little ones. Um, but to begin, we're gonna, um, the first thing you want to do is ensure that you're being honest in your conversations. This means that you can admit when you don't know the answer to a question. There's a lot of things unknown with FOP, so this is not uncommon. You also wanna avoid making assumptions um, about your child's understanding of FOP. Give them the opportunity to share what they know first. Um, kids are very creative, have a great imagination. Um, so they might have their own thoughts and ideas about FOP already. When you're having these conversations, don't be afraid to show your emotions. Um, learning about the diagnoses can bring up a lot of different emotions. Um, so as the leader of the conversation, feel free to express these. The emotions you're experiencing do not define the success of your conversation. So if you and your little ones start crying, that doesn't mean that your conversation is negative or that it's not going well. And with that, conversations can be overwhelming and filled with different emotions. So have a plan and trust your gut. You as a parent or caregiver know your child best. So you know when is a good time to pause and when to continue the conversation. Yep. Lastly, you wanna to speak to your child's needs. So tailor the conversation to their developmental needs and individual preferences and coping styles. Uh, and we'll explain the coping styles uh, a bit more in just a second. But in the end, you might not have all of the answers. So seeking additional professional support from like a psychologist or a social worker um, or even a therapist can benefit not only your child, but their siblings and you as well. So feel free to use these kind of tips to guide your conversation. Thank you, Lexi. So I'm going to talk about the first coping style. We have four different coping styles we're going to kind of go through. And the first one is a catastrophizer. So um, this a child who has this coping style will want to collect a lot of detailed information. They may have questions, but the way that they process that information is not in a comforting or reassuring way. So instead of feeling a sense of um, relief or understanding, what it actually does is exacerbates their anxiety. And there's sort of like the snowball that just keeps rolling as they imagine the worst case scenario. Um, and a lot of times children who have this coping style um, have had some previous negative experience related to their health that um, has kind of impacted that ability to cope. So the first thing to keep in mind is that you don't want to let yourself get involved in this sort of snowball picking up speed as it's going down the hill. Try to take um, an inner step back and listen to what your child thinks. So what's making him or her worry um, and what maybe former experiences are they associating with what's currently happening? And then if you're able to tune into what that person is, th is thinking and saying, um, you want to do it in a really empathetic way so that they know that they're being heard. So saying things like, I understand, um, or what I hear you saying is this, and just letting the person sort of lead you um, as they're expressing maybe some previous thoughts or some previous experiences. And then it can be really helpful for the person to look at the situation from different um, perspective. So for this child, you might want to, um, after giving them a chance to kind of share their experiences, provide some prompts for alternate ways that the situation could go. So um, they may have one experience in mind, but it's okay to um, definitely hear them out. Um, don't necessarily minimize what they're saying or judge what they're saying, but just acknowledge that fear or that worry and then offer an alternative um, perspective. 
So many catastrophizers become calmer when they're able to share their worries verbally. And then if you're able to have um, something that can sort of, sort of shift their focus. So if there's an activity that involves some sort of physical movement or um, something that keeps maybe their hands busy so that you can sort of have a chance to distract them through that activity um, while talking and giving them something else to focus on. And if you feel, I think Alexis mentioned this in the previous slide, but um, especially for children who have a catastrophizer coping style, if you feel overwhelmed in this situation and it's draining your energy, um, always remember that it's important to reach out to the supports, whether it's um, psychological support, counseling support, someone else who the child connects with really well to see if there's someone else who can help in that conversation. So. Um, the second coping style I'm going to talk about is a sensitizer. So similar to a catastrophizer, this child may be asking a lot of questions, seeking information, um, but contrastingly, that information actually helps them deal a great um, deal with their feelings and of anxiety. So just listening really attentively to what information the sensitizer needs, um, letting them again, take the lead and taking seriously whatever questions they have, and then doing research and finding answers that they can um, be happy with. A lot of sensitizers don't like um, a maybe or sort of ambiguous answers. So you, it is helpful to actually do some research, find some studies or statistics that can help give some concrete facts. Right, Alexis, so I'll hand it back to you. Sorry. Yeah, we have the minimizer coping style. Um, and this means that uh, your child will downplay the information you're providing uh, in order to cope with the anxiety and kind of uncertainty that they're feeling. So they're going to take the information that you gave them and process it in smaller chunks to make it more manageable for them. So as the time goes on, they will come to you with questions once they're able to take in more information. If you feel that uh, your child relates most to this coping style, you're going to want to allow them to take the lead and share uh, key information first with a lot without a lot of details. If you go in with a whole lecture and kind of steps to take, uh, your child can become easily overwhelmed and they might end up withdrawing themselves from the conversation. Uh, so to prevent that, think of it as uh, like a short conversa conversation lasting um, maybe about like the length of a TV commercial um, and then stop there. See where you are. Um, maybe you can continue the conversation and be prepared that this whole process of accepting and dealing with the situation, it might require a bit more time uh, to allow your child to process uh, the information that you're giving them without becoming uh, overwhelmed and anxious. The next or the last coping style we have is the denier. Uh, this is when your child will push information out of their mind. They do not want to talk about it um, and they might not even want to ask questions, uh, but this is in order to protect themselves from feeling any uh, unwanted emotions. So when you prepare for a conversation, knowing that your child fits in the denier coping style, uh, you do not want to confront them with hard facts or uh, go into the nitty gritty details. Try to use a careful tactic where you plant seeds of information. So in giving a whole slew of information and a long lecture, prompt the child to think um, and reflect on situations that directly relates to them. Uh, you can explore similar fictive and non-fictive situations and guide them slowly to how they should be dealing with these situations. Don't show them the connection between the situations that you're talking about and FOP, but let them discover it themselves and then they'll be able to process information related to FOP in their own way. So, now we're gonna start the conversation. Before you begin, uh, you wanna take some things into consideration. You wanna be mindful of the language that you're going to use. Are you going to say FOP for short or are you going to say fibrodysplasia ossificans progressiva every time? Are you going to use words like flare up and bone growth or maybe boo-boo and owie? So whatever you choose that 
fits within your child's vocabulary, make sure you're being consistent throughout your conversation. You wanna think about the time of day you wanna have this conversation. Uh, you want your child to be well rested um, and certainly have a full belly. Uh, you don't wanna have the conversation if it's right before a nap or a rest time and you know they're going to be irritable. With that, you also wanna have the conversation in a place where the child is comfortable um, or even while they're doing an activity for that they enjoy. So do they like to spend time coloring at the dining room table or playing with chalk outside of school. Those are some options of times that, and locations that you can have uh, these conversations about FOP. So once you figure out the language you want to use, when you want to have the conversation, where the conversation is going to take place, and the time of day that you're going to have the conversation, you want to make sure you preface why it's important to talk about FOP um, and that everyone involved in the conversation has the opportunity to, to share their thoughts, feelings, and ask questions. You want to remember that this conversation can happen in stages and always starts with just sharing basic information. Thanks, Lexi. Mm -hmm. So yeah, as we mentioned, the coping styles that we went through at the very beginning, um, you may not be able to have the full conversation with every child at one time, and especially depending on their age, that's likely not possible. So um, these key points to cover one through eight are really just goals for, you know, your conversation over time. And um, it's important that we wanted today's webinar to be really geared towards not just the child with FOP, but siblings as well, because it's important that um, they understand what's going on and why things may, certain things may be a little bit different at home. So you may want to adapt, you know, some of the phrasing or the perspective for these, um, if you're sharing it with a sibling, but these are really to just boil it down eight simple points that we felt were important to cover in educating your child in uh, making them aware of some things about FOP that are important for them to know. So the first one, um, is that, they didn't get FOP um, from being too close to someone else. FOP is not contagious in the sense that's a lot of um, younger children, especially will have that kind of proximity misconception that you get sick or you get things from being too close to other people. So we want to dispel that and make sure that they know that FOP is not contagious and it wasn't caused by something they did. Um, as they get older, you can start to talk about genes, how genes work. We're going to use some different analogies for that as we go through the slides later. Um, but certainly just starting with that main sort of causation, because I think that can be a common misunderstanding for kids. The second point um, is to make them aware that FOP is always a part of their body. Right now, at least until we have um, a gene therapy or something that can correct or cure FOP, um, it's important that they know that it is always a part of their body, um, even on the times when they're not feeling sick or when they don't feel FOP being active. The third point is to kind of give a little bit of understanding as to how FOP works. So FOP changes the instructions for how our body heals. And instead of instructing it or um, telling it to grow new muscles to replace old ones, it grows bones. The fourth point is that um, right now, the scientists and researchers who studied FOP or the doctors don't know all of the reasons why the new bones grow. Um, sometimes, you know, if a child has a flare up and we tell them that um, new bone grows when we injure our muscles, but they haven't injured their muscle, um, their imagination can really run wild. So just to make sure that they know that it's not always something they've done, that we don't know all of the reasons why. But we do know, so moving on to point number five, that when a muscle gets hurt, the instructions in our body that are different, that make us um, have FOP, make the bone grow instead of muscles. The sixth point is that um, some may say that one of the most important parts of this talk is the ability to set expectations or practices. So um, if you're a parent and maybe you're starting to bring up this conversation because you're having concerns about 
um, your child being able to advocate for their safety at school or their child being able, your siblings being able to follow some household rules that you've established, um, that it's important that they know that to protect the body, we have these certain things. And that's something that your family can really personalize and talk about, you know, what are the activities that you've said you are um, avoiding or kind of putting off limits as a way to um, prevent muscle trauma. The seventh one um, is that normal thing I wanted to mention is that normalcy is really comforting for children. So when they know that parts of their life may change, um, that can be really stressful. But what's actually very healing to have in the same conversation is for them to know that some things will stay the same. So as you're going through this, um, you know, you're going to be talking about a lot of new things about some parts of their daily life that may look different because of FOP. But if you can sort of pair that or have time in the conversation as well to focus on how different parts of their life will be the same or some things that your family will do that are consistent with the past, that can actually be really reassuring for them. And the last point is that children who understand that every person has traits that make them different from one another are children who also accept those differences. So um, it's really important that in teaching them about FOP, we're teaching them that these qualities, um, like every person has qualities that make them different. And this is one of the qualities that make them unique. So we're going to move forward now to look at some information for um, age specific. And if you don't have a child with FOP who is in this age range or a sibling, um, I would encourage you to try to take in as much as you can because you may have cousins or family friends down the road who you'll want to explain this to. So Alexis, do you want to um, take this over and start with zero to two? Yes, absolutely. Uh, and kind of like Hope said, talking to a two-year-old and a 12-year-old will look very different. So we're going to go all the way up in age range. So don't worry if your kids are later in age. Um, but at this age, from zero to two, children are too young to understand what is going on, but they're, they will notice changes in uh, the parents, caregivers, or other family members' uh, behaviors. So you can begin uh, to explain FOP by using words that are already in their vocabulary, um, which we kind of talked about a little earlier, which might be like sick or boo-boo. Um, you can point to different parts of your body or their body that are affected up by FOP to help the child make sense of those connections. Um, and with this age range, you wanna offer lots of opportunities for play, especially um, when they can use toys that help them learn about their bodies, like baby dolls, Barbies, um, doctor's kits, um, board books that point out different parts of the body. Those are all great learning opportunities um, and ways to start educating uh, kids in the zero to two age range about FOP. Thank you, Alexis. Um, the next age, age range we're going to look at is three to seven. And these may seem like really broad age ranges to a lot of you, um, but we base them off of sort of some of the developmental milestones and changes that children are going through. So for children between the ages of three and seven, they're going to be able to understand their diagnosis diagnosis when explained in more simple terms. So here's when you would really want to start introducing the name of FOP. And I want to say it's important for children to know the name of their diagnosis. Um, that's one thing that I would certainly encourage you not to hide um, because it's important for them be, to be able to advocate for that uh, if there's ever a time when they're away from you and they need to talk to others. Um, in addition to telling them about FOP and starting to use a little bit more of some of that medical terminology, um, it's important to focus on concrete aspects of care management. So these are the things that a child can um, visualize and see being implemented into their day-to-day -day life. So for concrete care, you may be focusing on things like lung health or oral health, um, some practices that you have during cold or flu season. And so you can say, you know, we're going to do um, bubbles, or we sing, or we swim in the pool, um, because it's really important that we keep our lungs strong. Similarly, with oral health, you want to focus and start helping that child connect that it's really important they brush their teeth um, because of FOP and the connection that is there between um, cavities or inflammation in the jaw and limited jaw movement. You also want to focus on how their day-to-day -day life may change. So this is a really um, good opportunity to 
implement some of those guidelines or the um, practices that you're putting around, you know, roughhousing with siblings, um, or maybe having more periods of time of rest during really active times. So um, if you're someone and every parent does handle this, um, this balance of childhood differently, but if you're a parent who, you know, wants to make sure that um, their child isn't overexerting too much, maybe this is where you would start to say, you know, we take these breaks um, so that our muscles don't get too tired. And so that we can keep um, the new bones from growing. So a few of the words that we have here, um, kind of scripts, if you will, is that FOP is always a part of you, even when you don't feel sick. That's something you may use in sort of explaining FOP and how sometimes they don't feel sick or they don't think they have FOP, um, but that it's actually always a part of their life. That FOP causes new bones to grow in places they shouldn't. And that sometimes the new bones grow and we don't know why, but we do know that when a muscle gets hurt, it can cause the new bone to grow. Um, another important thing I wanted to point highlight about this age range is that at three to seven years old, a child's thinking can still be very driven by fantasy, make-believe, imaginative play. So there's assumptions about how they, or maybe their siblings got FOP and how FOP works can really have the greatest room for clarification. So this is where you may want to ask them to start the conversation by telling you what they know or what they understand so that you can learn a little bit about where some of that imaginative um, connection may have come in. And then another thing is that children in this age group also need reassurance that they or something they did did not cause FOP. So they can be very um, egocentric at this in this way of thinking that it was all because of them or something they did. Um, and so just highlighting and pointing out that it is not um, they did not get FOP because of anything that they did. For uh, siblings, you could point out that you know um, they may see that they're their sibling with FOP has the two malformed big toes. And um, that has always been a part of them, just like FOP has always been a part of them. And it can be really reassuring if that sibling is maybe worried that, you know, do I have FOP? That's one very physical, concrete thing you can show to say, this is sort of a sign or a symptom of FOP and you don't have these toes. So that's one way we know that you don't have FOP. Um, a few sort of activities to go along with this age. And this is where we're kind of going to introduce the term therapeutic or medical play. And that, um, just to give a quick definition, is play with games, books, toys, art, or even role play that helps children express their feelings, fears, and anxieties, um, and helps them be able to cope with their diagnosis or treatment. So we've shown here just a few different pictures, um, this puzzle with bones and muscles. It's really important to um, help them begin to understand how bones and muscles work. That will help them process FOP if they know that the muscles are the things that help our bones move. But when a muscle is replaced by bone, that's gonna prevent movement. Um, so puzzles, this book, and then also these um, really like hands-on interactive activities that you can find where you use different things like a cardboard hand and a um, straw and string to kind of demonstrate how our muscles and ligaments work. Um, but the most important part is that we're giving really reassuring explanations. Um, we want to emphasize sharing information in a way that they're able to process using their senses. So what they'll see, feel, hear, um, because just our language at this age is not the most um, digestible format for them to be able to process information. One other activity that I wanted to mention is um, doing a an art project that is more of sort of a self-portrait. So you can ask them to draw a picture that represents who they are. Um, and this picture can kind of start as a, um, a launching point for them to be able to talk about and for you to learn about um, their overall self-awareness. So you could reflect on it by asking questions like, what do you like most about being you? Or what do you think the first thing others notice about you is? Um, and to start to get a sense of, you know, how they um, present themselves to others and what's important to them. All right, so seven to 12, this is where I was when I was 12 years old when AJ got diagnosed. So I can kind of relate to this age range. 
most. Um, so children who are between the ages of seven to 12 uh, are more capable of understanding and processing the details um, and more detailed explanations about FOP. Um, so a kind of uh, like the previous slide um, that Hope explained, there's some scripts on the screen that you can use um, and whether you jot them down, take a photo, use the recording of this um, to refer back to. Um, but for example, you can say like FOP is a genetic disease. Um, your genes are the instructions for making your body um, and the scientists haven't figured out how to change that FOP gene yet. There's uh, some activities um, online where you can like make like different uh, like DNA helixes and things like that. So depending on if your child has a drive towards science or things like that, you can incorporate that um, into your conversation as well. Um, so once you explain FOP, you wanna bring the conversation back to your child. Uh, they need information about how FOP can uh, impact their daily life, which can mean involvement in school and other activities, whether it be in the house or extracurricular. Um, you can talk about tools and strategies that they can utilize uh, to maintain a sense of normalcy. Um, so if they really want to be independent in their morning routine and be able to undress themselves and dress themselves, uh, maybe they're using a dressing stick um, or some other type of like extended hairbrush or toothbrush, uh, different things like that. So they know that even though as they're growing older, they still don't need a parent or caregiver to help them get ready in the morning that they can be independent in some aspects of their care. Um, so with this age range, um, children seven to 12 can also be afraid of pain. Um, so you wanna make sure that uh, that's a topic of conversation and you're talking about ways that uh, your family has decided to provide uh, pain management. Um, you also want to begin to introduce medical terminology and advocacy skills uh, to pre prepare for the transition to adulthood um, and your child being uh, a leader in their own care. So with all of that being said, um, conversations aren't the only way for uh, children seven to 12 to learn about FOP. Um, Hope, do you want kind of Sorry. Um, going into the next slide? Um, we have a book here, um, kind of like a different pain chart that has faces on it where they can point to it um, and kind of relate how their pain is feeling. Um, so like, uh, you know what I mean? The, the red face relates to the worst pain. Um, and what might your child use to describe that? Do they say, um, is that when they say that they feel sick? Or do they say they feel sick when they're kind of eh, in the middle at the yellow range? So you and your family can decide what those words are that you're going to use to kind of describe each level of pain. So you know when it's at its worst, when it's in the middle and when they're feeling just fine. Um, and then also you want to make sure that they have uh, opportunities to learn through reading, sensory exploration and interacting with other children who have FOP. So the photo on the right is from one of the FOP family gatherings um, in the fun zone where all the kids got to uh, be together and they actually got to participate in a magic show. So there's a magician behind them. So they had kind of all in one, they were reading different things. They were exploring uh, different sensory activities uh, and being together with other kids who have FOP. And again, thanks to Alexis for leading that wonderful activity with them. <laughs> um, we're gonna move on to cover the last age range and that is 13 and up. So, um, you know, during the teenage years, children are morphing out of childhood and into adulthood. And so they're able to understand a lot more complex explanations of their diagnosis and they may have more detailed questions for you. So they may be interested in learning more about um, how things work and offering them plenty of time to ask those, whether it's to you or a doctor or even a trusted friend is important. So um, offer for them to hear that information directly from their care team as much as possible. And you might've seen in Alexis's last slide that um, transition specialists, people who work directly with families to help them go from their pediatric to more independent or um, adult care centers, 
they encourage families to start this transition process between the age of 12 and 14, because we know that it takes um, children or teenagers a really long time to develop all of those skills to be able to advocate for themselves and to be able to have sort of the cognitive awareness of what they need to know going into their healthcare meetings. Um, another really important part about this age is that teens are very anxious about how FOP can impact other areas of their life. So emphasizing opportunities where they can continue um, to have normalcy or where you can promote normalization through whether it's, um, you know, different tools or things like Alexis may have mentioned getting ready in the morning or just experiencing social events with their peers. Um, this is really key to promote independence and help them feel um, ready to move on as they approach their next stage of life. So some of the words that are conversations you are going to have with them may sound a little different. You may be talking about, you know, the doctors have a variety of different tools, or you could say drugs or treatments not that people use to help manage the symptoms you experience during a flare up and that those are trying to stop the new bones from growing. You can also ask them to explain those and talk about which may work best for your child. Um, and this is an area where a lot of parents may also be um, exploring clinical trials. And that's sort of a whole other conversation that we haven't included in today's presentation. But I would say that if that's something you or your child is interested in, um, we are working on more resources at the IFOPA to help children be able to understand that very complex um, part of FOP management. Another aspect you might be looking at discussing with your teen is um, flare-ups. So during flare-ups, you know, the symptoms make it difficult for them to be able to stay at school or involved in different activities. And so how can we communicate with our teachers um, to create a plan to help you stay involved? A lot of, um, I think this is sort of proactive. We want to help our kids have the skills, have the knowledge so that as FOP progresses or if new things come up, they're not reeling and trying to process all of the information at once. They've been able to digest some of this over time and understand it to have the tools to make sense of new things that are happening as they get older and F their life with FOP changes. So if you can have these conversations, um, for preparedness and creating a plan earlier, that's gonna be really helpful, especially for those teens who are already probably worrying about missing out on things with their opportunities with their peers. And so a few of the resources um, to consider as you're having this conversation are, um, you know, trusted resources for future learning and support, especially now that our world is so um, digital, I think kids, have a lot more access to things on the internet. And that is both a curse and a blessing. And so how can you point them in the direction of content that is gonna be really supportive in their journey? Um, the IFOPA has a YouTube channel and we have videos here where they can learn about FOP from other people who have FOP. Um, and there are some really wonderful and encouraging stories here. So if you have a teen who's going through this, I would really encourage them to look to trusted sources um, and to start to digest it um, piece by piece. Another thing that can be really helpful is doing, as I mentioned earlier, planning, like whether it's a calendar or a schedule to prioritize their time with friends. Um, a big part of that comfortability with their friends may be that they're able to sort of explain FOP and they probably don't want to talk about it all the time, but having the skills to communicate it effectively once is very important. So I'm going to hand it over to Alexis to talk a little bit more about that. Yeah, so I know we gave you guys a lot of information, but to round this out, uh, remember that when you're having these conversations uh, with your child, you are not only teaching them about FOP, but you're providing them with the information to become the teacher and educate others. So by encouraging your child to become the teacher, you're giving them a sense of empowerment and an improved comprehension of FOP. Um, you might see your child take on this teacher role uh, by explaining FOP with their younger siblings or uh, cousins at a family barbecue, um, or maybe with friends at the park or at school. Um, so as they understand their FOP and become more comfortable talking about it, they can educate others. Some ways that they can do that is by leading a classroom talk, writing a letter, making a video, 
um, creating self-advocacy cards. Um, my younger brother, AJ, actually has done a lot of these things. Um, he writes letters every year to his new school teachers um, explaining FOP in his own words. Um, and then we provide them with some fact sheets um, and kind of he writes about what he can do, what he needs help with in the classroom, what he's excited about, what his favorite sports teams are. It's a little bit about everything. Um, and it makes him feel more comfortable going into the school year knowing that uh, he has already given his teachers a little bit of information about him and uh, his diagnosis. Um, most recently, he recorded a video um, of himself talking about FOP. He created a script and uh, recorded this video and it was released to his school on FOP Awareness Day. Um, and everyone, uh, each class in the school got to watch the video and then had like an activity and discussion about it afterwards, which is really nice to see. Um, so there's a variety of ways that uh, you can, ed your child or uh, siblings of your child can educate others um, and can kind of align with their interests. Um, in addition, the IFOPA uh, has a variety of resources um, that I'm sure Hope can speak to. Yes, so one of the resources I am going to show here in a second, but I wanted to say that um, the IFOPA really houses a lot of different resources that have been created by the FOP community itself. And that's one thing that I love about working at the IFOPA and the FOP community is that um, all of the different parents or siblings or, um, you know, caregivers and individuals with FOP are so committed to helping support one another. So if you're someone who's looking for some of that support, maybe you want a one-to-one -one mentor, some another mom or dad who's been down this path and can share their experience with you. I'm happy to connect you with them. Um, we have some examples of letters that parents have sent home um, at the beginning of the school year to share for children and their parents to read together. We have scripts for classroom talks that a mom has gone, lots of moms have gone into a, the classroom and spoken directly to the children at school. And then we have a video, um, which we love for people to share in the classroom or to share at home with students to watch at home. It is the same, but different. A look. Um, a animated video about a character, a child who has FOP. And what it really does is it just points out a lot of the ways that children with FOP are the same as their peers and a few of the differences. So it's a really helpful tool to share, especially for the younger years when people want to see um, things that are a little more entertaining. Maybe, you know, a talk is hard for first or second graders to sit and listen to, but they really like short, quick um, videos like this. So this film is just two and a half minutes long. And it's a really fun um, way to introduce and um, share a little bit more about FOP. So with that, I am going to stop our slides here. And I was gonna check to see if we have any questions come in. I haven't seen any yet, um, but I wanted to thank Alexis, of course, for joining me today in the presentation and um, just in speaking to the community about this. And I already said, you know, that I'm always amazed and really so proud and inspired by how much members of our community care and support for one another. And you're a great example of that, Alexis, and all of the many ways that you've worked to help support the IFOPA in our pediatric community. Um, so I guess one question that I do have um, is for those of you who have never interacted with a child life specialist before, um, it is something that is available at most um, children's hospitals. Some it's a little more hit or miss at local hospitals, um, but it's a really great resource to um, you know, request a referral for um, if your child is having anxiety about, you know, different procedures. So your doctor may not always um, bring them in. Staffing isn't always 100% covered, but um, it's something that's important to reach out and ask for. And Alexis, I was wondering if you would want to share just a little bit about the work you do as a child life specialist or um, not just child life, but therapeutic or recreational specialist um, so that families can have that maybe to go off of um, and ask their hospital if there's someone who can help support you, support them in that. Absolutely. So currently I work at a uh, 
18 bed inpatient pediatric uh, rehab. Um, so as a child life specialist and recreational therapist, I uh, see what children's interests are. I see what their leisure and recreation interests are. And I try to meet them where they're at um, and develop their physical, cognitive, social, and emotional skills through leisure and recreation activities. So we're able to engage in medical play. We're able to um, adapt different activities, uh, find different tools, whether it's an adaptive bike to be able to go on bike rides with your family or how that looks. And maybe we're playing card games with a card holder. Uh, maybe we're joining different adaptive sports leagues at a young age. Um, whatever your child's interest or your family's interest might be, um, how can we get your child to have a high quality of life um, by engaging in activities that make them happy? Um, so there's lots of options for adaptations out there. Um, like Hope said, you can find them at your hospital. Um, some recreational therapists work in community-based settings. Um, so if you need help kind of locating some in your area, please feel free to reach out to me and I'll reach out to my network um, and see if we can get you guys in touch with any uh, child life specialist or recreational therapist. Yeah. And I wanted to mention that Alexis and I are also available. If you have a question that you don't want to ask today, you can reach out to me afterwards and I'm happy to connect with Alexis and we could schedule a time or answer via email. However, works best because um, we do want to be a resource to you after today. Um, I did have one question come in. So Alexis, I'll read it and feel free to respond or I can chime in, but um, any suggestions? A, a participant was asking, or do you have any suggestions on how to respond to the why me question? Um, so Alexis, do you have anything you wanna start with or do you want me to jump in? Um, I can start off and then please feel free to chime in if you have anything else. Um, why me? You can go with, the, depending on the age of the child, you can say, we don't know. We don't know why this gene in your body has a mutation and why FOP has affected you. We don't know. Scientists do not have the answer. So if your child is old enough to kind of understand the science behind FOP and what a gene is, I think you can refer back to that and just say there, we don't know at the moment. Uh, we might never know, but also scientists are working really hard and we might be able to figure it out soon. Yeah, I agree. I would say, um, depending on the age range, if they're at a rate, an age where you can introduce genes, um, to kind of talk about how our genes can sometimes randomly change. And, you know, there's a specific way that they usually work, but sometimes things change and for no reason at all, um, you know, your gene changed. It was a random change in your gene that caused FOP. So it wasn't anything that they did. Um, and I think again, just sort of bringing it back to that everyone has things that make them different. So, you know, hair color, um, eye color, those are all related to our genes and those don't maybe necessarily impact people's day-to-day -day lives as much as FOP, but other, everyone has other examples of things that do impact their day-to-day -day life. They um, may not be as visible as FOP, but um, everyone has things that make them different. 